Hello and welcome to the next session of Found Christianities. This is episode 15 on Ptolemy the Valentinian. Ptolemy follows Valentinus in previous videos, as well as the Gospel of Truth and the Treatise on Resurrection. So make sure you get to see those videos as well. Just the rundown on the basic data here, Ptolemy is one of the known followers of Valentinus, probably in the 140s and 150s, and thus probably in Rome. By about 160, he is probably leading his own Christian circle in Rome because Valentinus has passed away. In a sense, he takes over the charge of leading this inner circle of initiates, very highly educated and very uh, inquisitive Christians in the imperial capital. As we saw in the Gospel of Truth, Valentinus did talk about the eternal thoughts of God or the eternities, otherwise known as aeons, and Ptolemy is, as Tertullian tells us, the one who systematized these aeons into a series of projections. And he did so using what seems to be the latest Neo-Pythagorean mathematics. There's a lot to say about Neo-Pythagorean cosmology at the time, and I highly recommend those who, uh, who are interested, check out Joel Calvus Mackey's monograph called the Theology of Arithmetic, published by the Center for Hellenic Studies. But the basic rundown is that there were two theories. Pythagoreans believed in paired opposites. So either you had a monad dyad pair, give rise to a tetrad, sometimes called the tetractis, and then you would get a decad. And out of the decad would be built the elements that make up this world. As the Platonists got their hold of this material, many of them by this time insisted that these pairs of opposites, this dualistic system is not sufficient. What we need is above the monad diet pair, another higher monad. We'll just call it the transcendent one who is without consort and who gives rise to the pairs of opposites without doing any effort or without actually willing it. It just sort of happens through emanation. And so out of the principle of oneness comes the principle of duality. And out of duality, you have the tetractis or the tetrad. And then because the tetrad is four, it gives rise to the decad because one plus two plus three plus four is a decad or 10. So this is the basic, basic idea. Ptolemy's adaptation of this new Pythagorean number system is that and we have to reconstruct this, but basically what seems to be is that he, he envisioned that there was a monad, that the God, the true God is a monad, is, is the ultimate one, who has a dyad, who typically gets called uh, a variety of things, but she is the principle of wisdom. And then there gives rise to an ogdoad, that is a set of eight. And from this set of eight, it branches out a decad and a dodecad, dodecad being a special name for a set of 12. So in other words, there's an 8, 10, 12 pattern resulting in 30 eternities. Now, it's not quite clear how he got the Agduid. Uh, he combined two te tetrads? I don't know. The dodecad, however, does seem to have a Christian flavor to it because there are, of course, 12 apostles. At any rate, this is the theory of 30 eternities, 
who are again the they either include the highest deity or they flow from him and this was a system a systemization of what Valentinus had said. Valentinus seems never to have envisioned these eternities as actually outside the, the mind of, of the Godhead. But Ptolemy at least is accused of envisioning these as almost as separate entities. But I think it's really important to keep in mind that they are consubstantial with God. They are simply whatever the aeons are, they are consubstantial with God. They are God's thought. They share his essence. They aren't different than God. God is a mental process. And these mental processes, if they're given names and they're given consorts, that's an interesting phenomenon. And that's Ptolemy's adaptation. But it's never lost on the Valentines that they're not, they would never describe themselves as worshiping like 30 gods. That's a uh, very crass uh, misunderstanding of, of what they're saying. And the other point to know is that they aren't sharing this material to everyone, okay? So, so you have to go through initiation. You have to learn a lot in order even to, to get to the point where you're ready to learn about these eternities, okay? So this isn't Christianity 101. This is advanced PhD level. How did the world arise? Kind of Christianity. But the point here is that you have very highly educated people who are really interested in the origin of the world and are ready to employ other systems, including the latest mathematics, in this case, Neopythagorean mathematics, to help them understand the production of the world. Now, what Ptolemy is better known for, and what I discuss more in the chapter on found Christianities, is a, his theory of the creator. And this we're very lucky to have this because uh, Epiphanius in the fourth century quotes an entire letter of Ptolemy. And it's a letter to a, a lady named Flora, whom he is trying to convince about his, his position on, on the creator. And Flora seems to have come across Marcion, whom we've dealt with. And obviously Marcion has the theory that the creator is evil, as we've said. But Ptolemy tries to convince her that that's that's not actually the case. Continuing the standard Valentinian line here, the creator is not an evil being, but a neutral one, a being on, on his own moral and intellectual journey. And you can tell what type of creator, what type of being the creator has, his character, just as Marcion did, from the, the kinds of laws that he gave. And some of the laws are um, bad. Um, as Tommy made so some some are interwoven with injustice. So, for instance, the principle "eye for an eye." There's a famous saying of Gandhi that if we really lived by the principle of "eye for eye," we would all be blind. It's an unjust principle, and it's really actually quite horrid when you think about it. There's no indication that this is meant metaphorically. Uh, the Jewish God wants you know. Eye for eye, hand for hand, foot for foot, and uh, this is really how justice was was done in the in the ancient Middle East. But not everything is inwoven with injustice. Sometimes there's there's a good law, like don't kill people. Uh, obviously, part of the Ten Commandments, but it's imperfect. And Jesus, when he comes, he comes to perfect that law. So Jesus says, you know, don't even get angry. And that, Ptolemy says, is the perfection of the law. And then there are laws which, as, as Gentile Christians like to emphasize, there are, there are Jewish laws which are entirely symbolic. And one of these is the Sabbath. The Sabbath is really not about literally resting on Saturday. It's about ceasing from evil deeds. And that's obviously not the only explanation, but it's the one that Ptolemy gives. So basically, the, the creator is, is a complex being. He's not entirely evil. Uh, he's just overall, um, but he's also imperfect. And we can tell that from the kinds of laws that he gives. But the most important deduction here is really very similar to what Matt Marcin gives us, which is simply, and I emphasize this, if the creator is not wholly good, that he's not the true God. That is, he's not the father of Jesus Christ. And that is absolutely basic. 
Okay, and and that emerges out of a reading of the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, that is what Marcin was saying, and what Ptolemy is is saying, but also trying to improve on who exactly is the creator, what's our relationship to him, which explains then how Christians deal with so-called Old Testament teachings. Well, if you we, if you get to know Ptolemy, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot. But if, if you really study again his letter to Flora, uh, you get the sense that this is a Christian teacher who, like many other Christian teachers, is part of a larger church network. But he's teaching advanced courses, as it were, freelance. So he has a, a circle of disciples. So they, they probably meet together independently of the normal liturgy. Okay. And they get together and they do advanced Christian instruction. It is a kind of school, but the school is also religious. They are really trying to understand the mysteries of the universe, and they are doing so in as part of their Christian worldview. So it's not a secular school, but they are, they have formed a distinct circle. But the important thing is I I don't see much evidence in Ptolemy thinking that he's part of a separate church. Uh, he's, he's part of a church in which there are many different types of Christian, and he totally acknowledges that. So there are Christians who would never, ever, ever want to talk about anything intellectual. Ptolemy has, uh, you know, knows that perfectly well. Uh, there's, there's Christians that would reject his teachings. He knows that very well. And then there's also Christians who accept his teachings and who have this spirit of inquiry which indicates that they are have a different kind of mentality and that they are whom Valentinians like to call the spirituals, whereas uh, most Christians are, were, uh, were not actually overly intellectually inclined, and in some cases they are, there are still parallels today. It's the very point that... Ptolemy and his circle was integrated into early Catholic networks. That is, they went to Catholic services. This is a point that hurt the Irenaeus. And it's really what inspired him to write his five-volume, okay, a huge, huge work called The Refutation and Overthrow of Knowledge, here, Gnosis, falsely so-called. This is usually uh, called just for short against heresies. But it's, it starts as a criticism of Ptolemy, and, and the Valentinians are the chief object of attack because they are, in fact, the most dangerous to Irenaeus because they are part and parcel of his own ecclesial network. And he doesn't like that, and he's not ready to cast them out, whereas they seem to be perfectly happy to belong to the larger Catholic, early Catholic network, and are wondering why people like Irenaeus are calling them names like heretic and asking them to leave. In fact, they don't leave. And it's very important, you know, not to confuse heresy logical rhetoric for what's going on on the ground socially. They, they don't leave, and they don't seem to leave until really that is, they don't seem to form separate churches really until about the, the early third century. Well, I just will close by thanking all of you for your support. It's very highly appreciated, and I hope you're getting a lot out of this. Thanks so much for your comments, and I hope everyone enjoys this day, and I hope that I can catch you for the next video. Thank you.